right, so very few rules. Um, I encourage everybody to ask questions. Gavin will stop me if I've missed anything, but it's better to ask questions and share information. There's no right or wrong during these discussions. Basically what our team does, is we do a little bit of research, we expose a topic, we talk about things that might be unfamiliar and we give everybody a chance to, to ask questions. You don't have to be a customer. You don't even have to be an expert. The fact that you joined the meeting today means that you're interested and you wanna learn and we're gonna learn as well. This entire process, we do it 26 times a year, forces us to dive deep on a particular topic. And the topic that we're diving deep on this week is one that some of you may be familiar with and some may be not quite aware of what a fugitive emission is or, and you may know it, but you might not know why it's important. And we're gonna talk about that today. All right, so understanding fugitive emissions. It, we're gonna do in 20 slides or less, I'm gonna say, but anyway, most of you know who I am. If you don't, um, you're welcome to email me. I'm happy to share any of my contact information or anybody else on the team. Uh, that might be able to be a value in answering your question. All right, so today we're talking about ESG reporting. The E in ESG stands for environmental. Uh, and we're talking specifically about refrigerants. However, I'm happy to answer questions on any of the other items in the E section. Uh, it's not that complicated. I really truly believe that in the environmental section of ESG reporting, um, we're talking about scope one emissions and refrigerants are the hardest one to report. But um, if you're wondering what ESG reports are and you're, you're new to this topic, um, these are reports that companies will provide to shareholders, uh, lenders in some cases, but external people. These become shareholder documents. Essentially, this is public information about a company and how they're performing. Um, there are qualitative and quantitative uh, metrics used in this reporting process. And it's important to note that the very first ESG reports started in 2004. And over the last 17 years, there has been very little movement or change in the structure of, of this reporting process minor changes, more informational, aspirational, uh, I would say, but that is, that is changing dramatically and rapidly. Um, simply put, scope one emissions are everything that you see in this middle tier here, and they include AC systems, anything that a company facility would consume in its normal day-to-day -day business and company vehicles. If for the purpose of refrigerant, scope one emissions, I mean, refrigerants are in scope one emissions, but they can also be in scope two emissions and scope three. Oop, don't know how I did that. Okay. Um, scope two emissions, if you're buying uh, chilled water or even if you're buying um, cold air or ice, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, and additionally, it's in leased assets if you have outsourced something and, um, or you're buying something and you're trying to track what's happening in scope three. Anyone have any questions so far? Okay. Scope one emissions are everything on the right side there. Hydrocarbons to warm or operate a property, power your vehicles and fugitive emissions. And fugitive emissions are what we're here to talk about today. I can tell you that fugitive emissions are difficult enough for people to understand that a company the size of Deloitte in 2014 suggested to all of their clients that they report emissions similar to the emission rate reported by the United States government. And so the US government follows an IPCC reporting protocol for reporting HFC refrigerants that come from refrigerant production in the United States. So if a chemical plant 
releases HFCs during the course of production or through the course of you know, fugitive losses from um, unintended losses, then they have to report that. So the US's present greenhouse gas emission numbers are approximately 1% of overall total carbon emissions. Now that was a mistake for Deloitte to choose that path because Deloitte didn't bother to understand the metrics that made up that 1%. And that led a lot of companies to underreport their emissions as a result of that advice. So presently in the United States, we lose about 600 million pounds of refrigerant annually to refrigerant emissions. I mean, through of refrigerant emissions due to fugitive emissions. So the average emission in scope one emissions for refrigerant is between 15 and 50% of scope one emissions are fugitive emissions when accurately reported. That's a big number, it's a big change and it's significant, but there's tons of evidence to, to back that number up. So that's a big number and that's a very bold statement. So does anybody wanna call me out, ask the question, Ted, why are you saying something so large like that? I've never heard that. Um, I'm happy to answer it. I spend a lot of time on this topic. Oh, come on, this is too easy. No one's asking anything. Either that or everybody fell asleep and dropped off. All right, I don't see any questions. I'm gonna keep going. All right, what are, what are fugitive emissions as they relate to refrigerants? They are. Ted, we just got a question. Okay, great. So do you agree with the EPA assumption of 35% leak rate? In some cases, I mean, I, I think the EPA tries to put a, a number out there. What we're finding is that the average leak rate from the average system owner will range between 15 and 25%. There are some 35, but we don't normally see anything as high as 35%. I'm pretty sure the EPA's publish rate is 25%. Um, and they, they were really trying to target refrigeration companies when they did that. That was their goal. They were trying to come up with a refrigeration uh, grocery store emission rate. But what it's proving to be, the state of California publishes their numbers to the federal government uh, annually uh, from their CARB R3 program. And it, the numbers are around 24.5% to 25% emission rate annually. So, uh, Lindsay, yeah, I feel strongly that something in the 25% range is accurate based on the numbers. And a lot of people ask, where are these leaks happening? You know, uh, I've got a maintenance contract and I don't see any refrigerants on it. Or I've got a maintenance contract and my guy tells me there's no way our leak rate's that high. Well, the 600 million pounds speak for themselves on the emission side, but most people aren't drilling through their maintenance records to find leaks or refrigerant transactions when they're doing their reporting. And also it's complicated to be able, you know, to have that responsibility to do that. And um, it's also at times can be very difficult to understand where all these material transactions are going. Are they going into smaller systems that fall below the 50 pound threshold? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that um, because essentially we're dealing with a marketplace that's out of sync with the responsibilities of reporting. So what's happening is, uh, and this is kind of creative of the HVACR industry. I've been in it for 28 years. We're a very creative group of people. Um, some people pride themselves on it more than others. But when the federal government set their 50 pound threshold for reporting, a lot of companies ended up with 49 pound systems. And if some of you guys are giggling out there, you should be. Um, I watched entire companies uh, over the last 28 years invest their strategy for building and installing equipment uh, on the 50 pound reportability responsibility to EPA. And the reason I find that really funny is 
They weren't focused on energy efficiency necessarily. They weren't even necessarily focused on uh, a best practice for investment. They were focused on how can I keep a piece of equipment below the threshold where I'm responsible for reporting to EPA. And in reality, the EPA's responsibility for reporting is so, uh, so easy to accommodate that to, to build your strategy around the 50 pound threshold meant that you may have undermined a couple of other really good ideas that would have uh, done your company better. But it's enough to say right now that sustainability reporting is not in sync with compliance reporting. All right, does anyone have any questions on that? It's a, again, it's a very important statement. When you're reporting sustainability, you report all emissions, not just your emissions on your assets that you report to the EPA. So if you're a service provider and you're listening and you're on this call, be aware that whatever you've been trained to record or report may not be sufficient enough in future years for the responsibilities that companies are obliged to report to, all right? Because there are no boundaries. Paul, sorry about that picture. Um, I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding, sorry. Uh, but there are no boundaries uh, in the reporting world for whether it's refrigeration, comfort cooling, or process cooling. Chase just asked everybody what kind of systems have more than 50 pounds. Um, well, it depends on the maker, but you, you know, any system, say above 25 tons, probably has uh, 50 pounds or close to 50 pounds in it. Um, so in this world, you're going to be reporting things as small as, you know, two, three pounds. You know, we work with a lot of clients um, and I have tons of examples, so I'm happy to share insights, but never names. But it's not uncommon to see a client have 10,000 assets, but only 800 or 1,000 of them are over the 50 pound level. So they might not report the re emissions from 9,000 uh, of the assets. They only report emissions from the 800 that uh, fall above the 50 pound level. But the, the reality of it is that's not what the expectation is by shareholders or the SEC, or the ESMA in Europe. I'm gonna take another look. I don't see any questions. I'm gonna keep going. All right, we're more than halfway. All right, there are five, five, five frameworks or standard setting groups that impact this disclosure. All right, CDP, um, that group right under CDP, the CDSB, was part of the CDP for a while. And if this is going to get confusing, uh, it's confusing for all of us. But I'll share some additional information. Uh, the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI. The IIRC, which is now part of the SASB, the Stan Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And there are others. There are several others. Um, we could talk about ISO standards. So ISO 14,000, one, ISO 14,064, that's another standard framework for reporting. Uh, there are very few ISO 14,064 companies in the United States, less than 6,000 locations. Um, but that number gets higher as you get to Asia. I believe the number of 14,064 registered companies in Asia is over 300,000. So it's big. It's a big, uh, big number. Does anyone have any questions about these five frameworks? Does anyone know who these five frameworks are? All right. Assuming everybody's still awake, we're going to continue to roll forward. We're almost done. All right. SASB, GRI, and ISSB. Now, I'm going to spend a minute here because this is very important. Um, the, 
And, and guys, I really want you to ask questions if you have any, because this is so important. The SASB, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, is now known as the VRF. Um, I think it's the Value Reporting Foundation. Uh, and they recently announced that merger. And what it was is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and the Integrated Reporting Council merged together to form this value reporting foundation. And the reason they did this is because companies were confused about what each of these frameworks and reporting structures, what was the difference and what were the similarities? And I want you to think of this as anybody on this call who's familiar with accounting, I want you to think of this as gap accounting versus non-gap accounting. So for instance, the difference between reporting uh, EBITDA in Europe and EBITDA in the US is gap versus non-gap reporting outcomes. And I, I wanna get that right, I'm not an accounting person, but in the US, EBITDA is not GAAP, and in Europe, it's not GAAP, but they have different accounting principles that lead to different outcomes. And uh, Gavin, if anybody's interested, we just wrote a blog about this in the last couple of weeks um, about how these differences uh, are also existing, like the difference between EBITDA and GAAP, um, how these differences exist in this accounting standards role for sustainability. Now, this is all moving so quickly that on the 31st of January of just this past couple of weeks, the Climate Disclosure Standard Board, which is the group that I shared with you on the earlier screen, consolidated with another group called the IFRS. And that group formed the ISSB. That's the group here on the right. All right. Now, we're not talking about all these groups today, but I want to expose you to these names, familiarize you with them, and then tell you that although there are differences, that essentially they've all committed to the same type of framework for reporting. And that happened last year in September. Does anyone have any questions about this? Uh, this new VRF, will they be used for double materiality that is coming? So Paul, double materiality is a great topic. Um, we talked about it a, while, a few weeks back. Um, I think November actually. Double, so the materiality says, okay, this thing had a, a financial impact on my company. Uh, could be anything. Tornadoes uh, that affected the Midwest recently and, and did all that damage and caused that loss of life. So tornadoes might show up. We're seeing an uptick in tornadoes. So we're seeing higher risk to our facilities in the Midwest. All right, let's say that's a materiality issue. Double materiality is if that person who's reporting that material impact then goes back and says, but we also have high emission rates of refrigerants. And as a result, we're now also having an impact on the environment that then caused the impact on our operation. So that's double materiality. Now, double materiality's undergone about an 18 month, really robust review. Um, London School of Economics has some great papers on this. Happy to share them with anybody interested. Um, Gavin can also share the blog, which does include references to all these documents in the blog. But double materiality is likely going to be a, a responsibility for filers uh, in Europe. So I don't remember the name of the acronym for the group in Europe that's looking at the, um, uh, that on behalf of the ESMA, which is the European stock market group that like the SEC. So it's the European version of the SEC. But um, the answer to double materiality in this is yes. All of these will address double materiality. Great question. Thanks for asking. Okay, now, what did they all agree to? They all agreed to this format, this framework right here. So they've decided, and I think they did a nice job on it, to break it down into information producers, 
and information users. Thanks, Gavin. Um, reporters, and this speaks for itself, uh, talks about the conceptual frameworks, disclosure topics, and disclosure requirements. And so if you follow this across, they included software providers in this in order to create validation of data in the transformational process from gathering to usability. And we like to call that here um, from the boiler room to the boardroom. All right. This is refrigerant records were no, you know, historically just used to record invoice level records and prove out whether we were financially responsible with our with our invoicing and, and online and in sync. But now those records have to be elevated to a different level of quality. So they have to become investor grade. So we're going to have to transform the way we we collect that data so that we can have validations against it instead instead of greenwashing, which is the other other outcome that happens from all this if you don't get it right. All right, let me take a look. I don't see any questions. Um, and Gavin, thanks for following up on everything. I appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions about this? Um, I even, we can even talk about the document it came from. Basically, the um, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, GRI, uh, and then the groups that make up ISSB, uh, as well as um, the IIRC, they all came together and they said, we're going to agree on a set of principles for the purposes of standardizing the outcomes. Now, how you get to that outcome will be different uh, slightly from group to group. Uh, for instance, in GRI standard 305, they just say things like, do your best to report all your materials. Um, Paul, great question on tokenizing refrigerants. So starting in 2010, we began the tokenization process of refrigerants for cylinder tracking. And you can do it. It's, it is achievable and, and we've seen it at scale. The challenge is getting contractors involved. And the government is put forward a program here in the United States to track uh, cylinders. So it, we're all eager to see what that looks like. Uh, but it, it is already um, uh, you know, part of the roadmap. Page 12, let's go back up here. Um, so this is 12. Lindsay, sorry if I didn't answer your question. Let me let me do this. Hold on a second. Lindsay, I, I opened it up so you could ask the question so I don't get it wrong again. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Um I sent you the link to the EPA's fugitive emissions guidance, and there's a table three on page 12 that says the default emission factors for refrigeration and air conditioning equipment uh, based on type of equipment. And so for the um, the equipment that I, I work in, uh, refrigeration, it says the operating emissions um, are 35%. Um, transport refrigeration is 50%, but all the other ones are 25 or below. So I was just wanting to make sure I was on the same page. So it's, you know, this is a great topic that you bring up the EPA is estimating emissions based on infrastructure, right? And they're struggling to get real numbers. We see the 25% number consistently when we're doing actual performance level uh, evaluations of companies. So 25 is something we see over and over again. Although we see outliers in the 35% range, it's very rare to see a 35% uh, continuously throughout an opera a company's operation. It, is that for air conditioning or refrigeration? It's kind of all of the above. Okay. It's uh, and you know we can go back to the macros on this. There's about two and two point two to two point five billion pounds of installed refrigerants in the United States, and we have about six hundred million pounds of emissions. So if you you know just doing the macros, it's nearly twenty five percent across the board for everything when you average it. Right. 
Some companies can do a lot better. I mean, we've seen emission rates as low as 3%, 5%, 8 um, And so to your point, though, that means if we're getting some 3, 5s, and 8s, there are some 35s and 50s out there in order to, for that to average to, to continue to exist. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then just a follow-up question, if that's OK. Yeah, go ahead. Um, for the installation of new units, um, would you recommend reporting the emissions, uh, just assuming that the total refrigerants that are charged into the system will eventually leak when you're annually accounting for those emissions? Or do you just assume like a percent of capacity was leaked during installation, like 3%? I'm an optimist. And, but I'm an optimist with 28 years experience of doing this. And when companies are charging systems, new systems, I, I like to follow the performance. So there's really three ways to do this. You can estimate your emissions, right? Um, and you, so you can come up with some type of factor and that factor will be maybe more reliable than your normal estimate, but it, it's still not accurate. And then this, so we'll call that the, the estimate and then a factor. We also internally use a factor when we onboard new clients or when we talk to people um, based on their profile. We have a set of questions we ask that can tell us a lot about the questions that you just asked for emissions. So we don't actually like to report any emissions during install. All right, we like to report the actual charge that came on site was added to the system. Now, the second thing that we have is this prescriptive model of estimating, which is more along the lines of a refined estimate. And you've got to be really careful with prescriptive models because you can become reliant on their values, but not know what they're based on. And so you, you see that you'll find that people will start to make things up. And that can make companies feel uncomfortable, particularly because right now at this very moment, we're transitioning from an aspirational model for ESG reporting which is largely around hopes and expectations to a much more financially oriented structure. And that's why groups like the SASB and, and uh, GRI and, and the others are all coming together is to create better methodologies for these numbers. Now, they're only at the top level. They haven't drilled down to where you are just yet. But I'll tell you this, those refrigerant emissions that happen, if we start to overtrack them, will create as much distrust in the system as if we under attract them. So we want to get as close to accurate as possible. And some of the ways we can do that are rely on the numbers that contractors provide us, but find a way to elevate those numbers that they're giving us through the record chain to a higher level where we can validate. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. The, the issue at hand for at least my scenario is the lack of data. You're, you're living in a world of a lack of concrete information if you're in the right. refrigerant space. So the numbers that I have are the, the capacity and charge of the units that were installed. Um, and they had a big, big swap out um, over the year of um, uh, new units to replace um, poor, perform, poor performing units. So just trying to understand if all of the charge in the installed units should be assumed as eventually being emitted. And then going forward, assuming the loss percentage or doing the other option of just like 3% of that initial capacity, the installation emission factor that EPA recommends. Yeah, and I think if you were to, if let's say you, you were to move that calculus to the end of the equipment's life, instead of leaving it at the beginning, you, you might find a little bit more comfort there because it actually could leak the charge, the total capacity of the system, not once or even twice, but multiple times. So a system could actually leak 300% of its charge over its life. Right. The option A that I described, you would just be assuming any refrigerants purchased are ultimately leaked because they're replacing refrigerants. And then that just 
using that to account for the associated emissions. The other way is a bit more complicated and has a bit more assumptions on like what you can't really measure leak rate wise, but would probably be more accurate. So it's just a tough, tough place to be in. Yeah, we, this is what we do for a living is, is help people measure and calculate these things. That's, that's the science that, that we bring to the solution. Um, but what I'll tell you is if you, if you too early on make the assumption of leaking and say, okay, well, any install is eventually an emission. Um, it gives the rest of the operation downline from that a feeling that there is no accountability. So if you start the accountability at the install, and what you might find is, okay, let's move this, this leak rate to a scientific place, you know, some place where we can measure it continuously because the, the guys in the field are actually measuring this. Like measuring as in how much refrigerant they're adding to the yeah. unit. So creating it that way. Gotcha. Well, thank you. I don't want to digress you too much, but I appreciate it. No, you're not. You're not at all. That's why we're here. That's the discussion we have. All right. And uh, let's see. Oop, wrong way. We're almost done anyway. So let's get to it. So if you want to follow the IPCC's GHG calculation tool, these are the 13 items that you would want to account for. And Lindsay, to your earlier statement, it does get complicated. And the reason it's complicated is that material transactions do not have the same oversight or validation that accounting transactions have. Yet the expectation is that we'll provide some accuracy. It's very hard to have accuracy without accountability. The only way to get there is you have to build some type of accounting process. In. Otherwise, you'll be estimating forever. When I first started this in 94 and we were measuring things, um, leak rates were the hardest thing for people to calculate. But then over time, people started to calculate for the larger system. They just didn't feel as comfortable calculating for the smaller systems because they felt like it was a daunting task and a huge responsibility with lots of extra paperwork. Um, you've got to remember that in this industry, we started with about 300,000 contractors uh, two decades ago, and we have about 300,000 contractors today. So uh, I feel that there aren't enough people to do all the work that's needed and so what ends up happening is we skip steps. But then we hope that although we skip the steps, you know, we have enough logic built in to, to create near accurate estimates. And that really becomes a challenge. Um, let's see, let me stop for a second. Craig asked a question when estimating level of refrigerant capacity in an actual system versus nameplate capacity, should you assume some level of increase to allow for additional refrigerant in the system? I believe the nameplate manufacturer charge only has limited allowance. And Craig, I would say it can be true of that, but manufacturers are also, uh, you know, very specific pieces of equipment will have very specific charges. Uh, maybe some slight charge adjustment in the field, but if you build the right, because we're gonna talk about something at the end, we're not gonna dr drill, drill into it, but we're gonna talk about it at the very end. But if you build some type of policy program into whatever accountability system you've got, then you're driving towards governance, not just policies. Policies without governance here are just going to fall apart. So in the accounting world, I feel like you rely on the nameplate unless otherwise proven wrong. Seasonal variances are another one. Boy, I, I'm afraid to even bring that topic up. Um, Yes, larger systems will get significant seasonal variances, um, but it's also important to note that sometimes a seasonal variance is a low charge. Get it? We're really talking about leaks, but what we're talking about is charge anomalies. So overcharging, undercharging. Um, and, and so Craig, somewhere between your and Paul's statement, there is this science of how do you manage these ups and downs and fluctuations in, in refrigerant charges in systems? And uh, about six years ago, we participated in a study in, uh, in Abu Dhabi at the airport. And we found out that 98% of the assets that we were working on uh, and evaluating uh, did not have the proper charge. Only 2% did. 
So we're going to call that a random act of success. But in all of this stuff, that's why measuring things is so important. You know, measuring your in, your out, your returns, you get away from these estimates. The estimates should be your first year's initiative. Start with estimates if you don't know what your emissions are. And in your second year, start to cut back on those estimates. Maybe you estimate the smaller systems, but you've got accuracy on large. You know, you set yourself on a journey to improve accuracy by building in governance and accountability. Don't just throw a bunch of policies around, but governance. And I wasn't going to talk about it to the end, but there is a big difference between governance and, and policies. These are good questions. All right, I'm going to keep going. We're almost there. All right, presently, there are no mandatory ESG disclosures, but it's going to change. And it could change in the next two weeks. Um, every indication we have from the SEC is that they're moving rapidly to read through, review, reflect on, make modifications based on the um, the request they had for people to make comments last March. Um, and once this ESG become, once these ESG reports become mandatory, and, and I'm gonna tell you an interesting story, it does change the level of responsibility we all have to take in accounting for what these material transfers are. Um, this conversation started at the SEC years ago about ESG records were much more like shareholder documents than they were marketing documents. And there were a group of shareholders, private equity companies, that felt like they could not get accuracy from a company in their ESG reports. And they felt as though this was undermining their ability to make good decisions, both about debt and investment. And so they put a lot of pressure on the SEC and the ESMA to come up with some type of standard that all these private investment or investment-based or banks could use when they're making a decision about placing money in a company. And throughout this process, I've been on a number of these discussions. I don't know how many, but a lot. I've heard, I've heard things about who actually runs a company, you know, whether it's the shareholders or the board or the, or the executives. I mean, I've been in all kinds of those meetings. I've heard people talk about accountability. I've heard discussions on risk, materiality, Paul double materiality. Um, and in all of that, the SEC has now got this, they're down to the wire uh, on collecting all these uh, responses and feeding them into the system that will lead to what is very likely a scope one and scope two emissions reporting responsibility for companies. But I think the reason we haven't seen an SEC, a firm SEC statement, is I believe there's a lot of pressure on the SEC to require uh, scope three emissions. I, I talked to two firms last week that were very, um, they really believe solidly that the SEC was going to include scope three emissions in their release. I'm, I'm not there because I haven't been in the room with that group of people, but from my discussions and reading through all of the, uh, the disclosure comments, it looks like universally scope one and scope two um, are supported. But scope three is, is somewhat, what's a lot more complicated. Um, and so I don't know if the SEC is ready for that yet, but I'm not at the SEC, I'm here. So maybe they will move uh, to include scope three in the, their uh, requirements. However, I feel very strongly that they will include scope one and scope two sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, I didn't talk about scope two today much, but I wanted you to understand the fugitive emission side and get a feel for what that accountability challenge, what the challenges are around that accountability. All right, that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions, additional questions? And, and Lindsay, I may follow up with you later if that's all right. Okay. 
Did we miss anything else? Gavin? No, I think that's it. All right. All right, how long did it take us? Okay, about 45 minutes. minutes. Yeah, not bad. Um, I know I rushed through some of that. I value everybody's time and I, I'm a very appreciative of anybody who participated because we're all presently under the, the gun to get um, reports, numbers in, um, get them cleaned up, you know, make sure they're accurate, uh, clean up historical records that are, are needing attention. So thank you to everybody on this call. Uh, and if you didn't feel comfortable uh, asking a question or you didn't formulate it completely, you know that you can always reach out. Um, we'll send a follow-up email, and um, we're happy to we're happy to change our our position on things as better data comes in. So it's not about being right; it's it's about participating. That's the most important thing. All right, Paul Lindsay, thanks for your questions. Um, same thing goes for. Uh, Let's see, I Chase asked a question and um, Craig also, great question. So thank you, everybody. Have a terrific day. Thank you, Ted. Good stuff. All right, bye.